Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. My name is Peter, I'm a recovered alcoholic. So I made one phone call and everything's running, huh? <laughs> Grateful to be alive and sober and part of a sacred place called Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm grateful to be here and share with you uh, my experience, strength, and hope over the last six weeks or so, and uh, whatever we have left at the end of this month to uh, walk through 10, 11, and 12, and growing in understanding and effectiveness and sharing on this sacred message to others who are still seeking. Uh, God separated me from alcohol June 23rd, 1988, and uh, I am a recovered alcoholic. Um, The message we're passing on to other alcoholics, it's interesting, uh, very often we can be uh, uh, concerned about what message we're passing as we ought to, uh, but what alarms me just as much is how many folks have never heard the message. And so I always ask, well, where are we? Because we meet in workshops like this this week, you guys, some of you guys be going to a workshop, probably three, four hundred people there. And I guarantee on Monday morning someone will be in a meeting not knowing what they suffer from. And worse, can't find someone to find out what they suffer from and tell them about it and how to get well. So we have a huge responsibility to pass on the message. In the basic text, it says on the third edition, But the basic text pages 1 to 164 have remained unchanged. This is the AA message. So we got to ask what message are we passing on? And very often we'll talk about 90 meetings in 90 days. That's not the AA message. We talk about don't drink and go to meetings. That's not the AA message. Or put the plug in a jug, keep a green member where you come from. That's not the AA message. I don't know what message that is, but it's not the AA message. And people who say that mean well. They're not looking to hurt anyone, but it's not the AA message. And when I tell a drunk, don't drink and go to meetings, I must not be a real alcoholic because if I'm successful in not drinking and going to meetings and I don't need the 12 steps, nor do I need a relationship with God, then I'm probably a moderate or hard drinker passing on a message to a real alcoholic who needs to have a relationship with God. And in order to have a relationship with God, there's some things that need to be done that I needed to be, that I needed to do, and that was to remove me. The complete removal of self and self must die. In order to me, for me to experience oneness with this power called God, and not just give God lip service, faith without works is dead. And so what sort of relationship have we uh, uh, grown with? What sort of relationship do I have with God? What sort of relationship have I developed with God? And if I just show up to Alcoholics Anonymous, like me, a lot of us use G.O.D., Group of Drunks, the Good Only Direction. That works for a while. And we experience this loving grace of God just for being his child. And we seem to stay stay separated from the substance for a while. But at some point, I needed to find a personal relationship with a God that was close to me, of my understanding. And I tried many ways to do that. It was through horror. It was through money. It was through property, prestige. It was through things, external conditions, trying to get me right with God. And when I look back on my life, all the alleyways I walked down, all the, all the roadways I took to experience something other than me, at the end was really trying to experience this nirvana, this bliss God. And I did for a little while. It was short-lived until the stuff went away or they left or the money ran out or the job was removed, whatever it was. And I experienced this this blissful feeling, this euphoric feeling, this nirvana, and then it was removed. And I was back to doing what I had to do and chase the next one. The next one being our next relationship, more money, more drugs, more alcohol, whatever it was. And it wasn't until I landed in Alcoholics Anonymous and all those options were out, although my mind kept feeding me, we have another option. When I knew in my heart of heart, at a cellular level, that those things were not working, I felt really screwed at that point. Because I knew nothing about turning to God. And and God is this thing out there that's kind of, I can't, it's not tangible. How do I lock into this God? How do I hook into this God? And I watch people in AA being very sure about God. Well, what an order I can't go through with it, huh? And there were a lot of things blocking me from this power called God. God is basically contempt by the investigation. All my skepticism, all my doubt, all my resentments, all my fears, all my stuff. All the things that caused me hurt and pain 
all my failings, all my expectations that things were going to work out, and here I am homeless in 1988. Well, where was God? And now you're asking me to turn everything to this power called God. Well, what an order I can't go through with it. But what choice do we really have? What choice did I have June 23rd, 1988? And so I began sheepish about it, praying to God, waiting to get some sort of punishment from God or some sort of uh, justice from this God for all the things I did and nothing happened other than me getting well. Because there were no judgments with my God. I don't have a judgmental God. I have a God of all love and no opposite. In fact, my God doesn't have to waste time forgiving me because he's never been upset. And so I began, and as I go through 4 through 9 specifically, self begins to die. And I start to experience God along this way. And I start to see things in my life starting to change, things within me, my perceptions and conceptions about everything. We read the great fact before. Are those just words on a page? Or does that come to fruition for me? That everything's completely flipped. How I hear, see, speak, and be is coming from a place of stillness or God, truth. Or am I still running the show in some way, still trying to interpret the moment, trying to figure out the moment, trying to angle in on the moment, or is the moment the moment I'm part of it, the same way I'm part of my breath? As long as my mind is in the way, I will not experience God. And when I say experience God, I don't mean we won't start to have experiences with God, but to truly experience God, I cannot be in the way. I often joke that when I do these things, I hope I don't show up. I mean, the body's here, but I hope Peter Marinelli's somewhere else. In fact, I hope Peter Marinelli's long gone. And what comes from me is the spirit, a relationship with God, oneness, not twoness, not separateness, no duality, but just oneness with God. And very often we talk, we claim God with our lips, but do we really experience God at a place where there's nothing between me and God? In fact, I'm willing to go to any lengths, the ends of the earth, pick up my cross and go, in the name of God. Really, where do I stand? It's got to be like that with sobriety, going to any lengths in order to get recovered. Any lengths is any lengths, and it's none of my business. My life is none of my business. And as long as I think my life is my business, I have a first step problem, because I'm still controlling where the car is going to go. I still got one hand on the wheel, and I'm not letting go. And I don't care if you let go and leave claw marks, but you got to let go. And we will arrive at the archway and enter the world of the Spirit. We'll get in there, but we don't get free room and board. And still, with all the things done, we're still kind of wrestling. And I don't mean the moments where we get a little fearful, moments get a little angry, moments get a little agitated. I'm talking about that becomes a way of life. I'm really not getting along with people because I have no relationship with God. I can't even get along with myself. Being in my own skin is troublesome. So what am I talking about when we say a relationship with God? There's a great story. I just read it, and I'm, I'm going to do some damage to it, but just go with me. Carpenter's walking, and he gives a talk to the people in the town. And they love what he has to say. And they applaud him, and they give him accolades, and they start to follow him. And he puts his hand up, he says, don't follow me. He says, you believe in me, but I don't believe in any of you. This is coming from a man of peace. Because he knew in their hearts they wanted little snippets of what he was saying, but really they were not willing to go to the any lens, the many any lens, to truly know him and to truly experience God. And I have found in 10, 11, and 12, I need to let go of everything if I really want to, if I really want to get to that place of experience oneness with God. And when I get to that place, it seems like I can wear the world like a loose, loose garment with all the things that are coming at me. And today, I get hit with 8 million things, including the concern about my dad's health at around 5.30. Everything came at me. So how do I move through that? Chop wood and carry water. And knowing I walk with my God and there's nothing between me and my God. And we'll get to a place where nothing will dare to stand between you and God, because it knows better. There's a great phrase, I, uh, uh, it goes something like, instead of telling uh, a God how big my problems are, I'll tell your problems how big my God is. So where am I in this relationship with God? Because that's what 10 and 11 is demanding of me, to have a relationship with God. It's about growing and understanding and effectiveness. So I might have a little bit, a handful of God. They're talking about nurture that, get my soul food and grow. 
And in 10 and 11, it's about me continually removing me. And when I say me, it's about this predator called the thinking mind. Because believe me, it'll get in there. Step 10 says not to rest on our laurels because I'm headed for trouble. That's all mind and ego. Well, I did a great job at work. I did a great job with this sponsee. I did a great talk somewhere. Well, I just made a whole bunch of money. My mind says, good for you. Now relax. You can relax. You don't need to do anything else. You don't have to write inventory. Don't worry about God. God is everything, so don't worry about it. You know. God loves me, so I don't, in fact, God loves me a little bit more than you, so I don't have to pray. Come on, we all at some point think we really got it. They pray to God, but me and God got it going on. These poor sufferers, they have to still do some more work. When I'm thinking like that, that means I can't get to you. Because I'm playing better than, because my God's a little bit better than you. I really got to lock on God. And if I really feel I'm having an experience with this God, then I move to give it to you and shout it from the rooftops. It's not about better or worse, up and down, left and right. That doesn't exist anymore. If what I'm saying to you disturbs you, or if what I'm saying to you is, seems foreign, it, it's because you haven't had an experience with God. Or you have and you've rested on your laurels. And we become frustrated. If you get what I'm saying, you get what I'm saying. What's my relationship with God currently look like? Guys, we don't need 10 or 15 or 20 years to have a relationship with God either. You have 90 days, you have 30 days, 60 days, 20 days. I don't care. The spiritual life is not a linear one. It's a, it's a transformational one. And God is God. Doesn't wear a watch, doesn't need a calendar. It just is. All I need to do is touch it. All I need to do is get into it. All I need to do is hook into it. It's always present. It doesn't just show up and goes away. But the path is a very, very narrow one, which the mind doesn't like. The ego, it gets frustrated by that. The path, this path gets narrower and narrower and narrower, but yet in the narrowing of that road, there's a tremendous amount of freedom. I have a, I have a valley in front of me and a narrow road. It makes no sense to a thinking mind, but when we're on this path, it makes perfect sense because experientially we can talk about this. In the narrowing of this road, my disciplines of prayer and meditation three times a day. That sounds really strict. To you it is. To me it's freedom. Perceptions of situations cause me pain and suffering rather than the reality of it. So a newcomer comes in and says, prayer and meditation three times a day. This guy's off the hook. And I say, well, how are you doing? <laughs> this is your what, 200 white chip? You know? huh? It's the coffee, trust me. <laughs> we spiked it. <laughs> White chip. <laughs> the sense of who I am, who we are, doesn't come from thought, doesn't come from mind, it comes from spirit. The sense of who we are. Who are we? I have people saying, I need to find myself. i got to find myself. Trust me, you don't want to do that. <laughs> I'm going to give it right back. This is me. Give me a double. I need, uh. What we want to do is be rid of self. Self must die. Because when, if we do find ourself, and that's like, you'll be in therapy for the next 2,000 years still discovering who you are. And still drinking away to find out who I am. I've lost myself. No kidding. You don't need to find it. The best thing that can happen to someone like me is that self dies. I lose self completely. Let self die. The death of self before the physical death. But this thing that we always try to get is a sense of self that always comes from the mind, always comes from thought, always comes from ego. Well, what is that? It's a makeup of what I think I am based on years of being around people. I shared this this morning with some folks. The moment we were born, the doctors do what they do and place us on mom's chest. One minute old. Now, mom and dad had a, a through an act of love, we're here. But they really didn't create us. God did. And there was a purpose for me being born and a purpose for us being sober, huh? But even with one minute old, we were already existing. And mom and dad says, now what? What do we do with this, right? Well, we're going to love him or her and give him the best we can. And personality traits start to get formed. 
You're good, you're bad. You're great, you're terrible. I'm going to punish you. God's going to punish you. God loves you. We get all these messages, and by the time we're seven or eight, the ego starts to wake up. We start to take in belief systems from schoolmates, from, from friends on the corner, from grandma and grandpa, and then we have this personality in front of us, and then we go to high school, and we learn more. Then we go to work, and we become the worker personality, and then we get into relationships, and we become the stud, and we become the lover, and we become all these other personalities, and that's who we think we are. It's what we've become. It's not who we are. And what the process of recovery is asking us is to remove all of that and get down to what we really are, spirit. With all the scars, with all the banging up, with all the things, with all the track record, at the core was spirit. That's pristine, indestructible, and perfect. Even in my brokenness, I still walk with a spirit that is perfect. And I need to get past all of that in order to touch that and experience oneness with it. Ten and eleven. Step ten is a page and a half. A page and a half of incredible spiritual information. Yet... We'll go to an AA meeting and make the topic. Tonight's topic is going to be entering the world of the spirit. Silence will follow. Why? I thought we wanted a relationship with God. I thought I claimed God with my lips and I have a God relationship. Yet, step 10 talks about very clear-cut, precise, specific directions on how to grow in understanding and effectiveness. Just with step 10, my walking around step. We don't even look at it. I'll figure it out on my own. And that's exactly what we're doing. I'll figure it out on my own. I have enough years to navigate through life, really. So I guess self-reliance is the solution. Self-will is the solution. And there's no God in that. So we become all these things. And 4 through 9 is about removing all of it and grinding the ego into dust. And it doesn't feel good. The medicine doesn't taste good. Sometimes getting to experience God is uncomfortable. We get squeezed. We get pushed. We get bent. But at some point, we reach this place called nirvana, this bliss, this God experience. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, our book says, right? Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. But when God shows up, God shows up. And it's profound. It's life-changing. It's mood-altering. And you know it. And any of us who have ever stood in the presence of the Lord, in the presence of God, and some of us have, where we're having that real God experience, very often we will weep in that presence. It's that powerful. It's that overwhelming. And you try to convey that message or share that story with another, with another drunk or someone else, and they get it, but they don't until they walk that walk and have their own experience. And some of us in here may have had that. And you can't plan the day. You can't plan the moment. You can't say, I'm going to do this to get that effect, because God doesn't operate that way. When I think I'm going to do this because I'm going to get that, guess who's running that show? I'm actually ordering God around. Okay, God, go here, now go there. When I'm ready, I'll... You ever see these baseball players that hit a home run and thank God, like God has $100 on a game making make, make sure a home run? How did that happen? Thanks God, he hit a home run. God's on my side. <sighs> but what I do is chop water and plow the field, let God do the growing. The same way a doctor does the surgery, God does the healing. I show up to the altar and I pray and meditate and do all the things they ask me to do, and then God's going to do what God's going to do here. Give me a message to share, some experience and hope to work with a junk, take these principles into all my affairs and worship this power. Not too, not too difficult to do. But how I get there and the roads I take are none of my business. I just need to chop wood and carry water, keep moving forward. And when I make mistakes, fix them. The road has narrowed in 10 and 11 for sure. It's prepping me. It's really prepping me to go out there. I mean, by the time we get to 10, 11, most of us are already out there working and sponsoring people. But this is real preparation to go out there because it's Looneyville out there. We know that. If you've been watching CNN news lately, I mean, it's, it's bizarre. But I heard a talk by Bill Wilson. It was like 1951, 52. And he talked about how we're living in dangerous times back then. So it's the same old story. So how do I navigate through that? I better be going with God. And 1011 pressed me to go out there. And continually trims me and trims me and trims me and cuts away the dead branches. The pruning that we experience in 1011. And am I still willing to go to any lengths to experience God? 
But I've gotten comfortable with my double digits. I have my set meetings that I go to. God forbid I'll veer off once in a while. Can't do that. Because no one knows me at these meetings. I need to go where I'm known. So everyone says, we love you. And I sit down like a, the grand poobah of AA. Yeah. Right? Or do I go to a meeting where there's some sick and suffering folks and see who I can work with? I have my set meetings. I have my sponsor. I have my little prospects. And they're all there. And I go to the same thing. And I don't do anything different. I don't pick up any, any other spiritual books to grow. I don't listen to any other religions that might be talking truth, you think? I'm a Catholic, means I can't sit with a rabbi. What? I'm a Jew, I can't listen to a priest. What? Now we're back on CNN News. Let's drop bombs on each other. That'll work. The great thing about this message I have found, the great thing I found about this message over and over and over again, every time I've gone to the work, it splits me wide open, and I find myself in a place of ease and comfort, wide open to anything that can bring me to a deeper and more effective relationship with God. So, when you sit with me, I have more to give you. And the byproduct of that, because it's not the first thing, but the byproduct is that when I sleep, when I lay down at night, I sleep. I can be in a relationship and be loyal and not have to say, wow, look at me, I've been loyal for this long. It's who I be. I can go and give a 10-hour day, an 8-hour day, a 15-hour day, whatever it is, and multitask and say, I do this, I get to do this. And it's no like, look at me. It's just part of living life on God's terms. The road has narrowed. Very often when we talk about 10 and 11 out of the book and the growing and understanding and effectiveness, some of us get really squirrely. We get uncomfortable with that. Rather than saying, hey, what can I do to know my God more? I got stuff in the way. I still got things that I'm holding on to. I still have resentments and fears. I still have that thing or things that cause me pain when I remember them. It hasn't been put in its place. And I've never given God an opportunity to put his hands on it and heal it. Because I got things to do. I'm busy. I tell you this because I've been guilty of living on both sides of the fence here. Because there was a time in my sobriety, oh, maybe 12 years, um, 10 years, um, I was one of those guys who went through the work one time, 1, 2, 9, into 10, 11, and 12, and I stayed in 10, 11, and 12, because that's what I was told. Nothing wrong if you're growing and understanding and affecting is going through the work one time. I don't want to split the room, but I'm on both sides of this, so I talk to you from a place of experience, and I start to hear about some folks who were going back to the work over and over again, 1, 2, 9, 10, 11, and 12, accessing a tremendous amount of power, God's power and get rocketed into 10, 11, and 12, and that power take us back into 1, 2, 9, and self-die some more. And they seem to be really free. But my contempt prior investigation was they're doing it wrong. And this is it. Hang in there. And God put a new sponsor in my life, and we went. And he showed me in my entire lineage, back to Dr. Bob, was about reworking this, reworking this, reworking this. Paul Martin started it pretty much. 1 through 9. 10, 11, and 12. 1, 2, 9, 10, 11, 12. And they were getting freer and having deeper and more effective experience, uh, spiritual experiences because self wasn't in the way. And we killed the mind. I often tell folks my goal would be if everyone could lose their mind permanently and go through life moved by spirit. Think about that. Just think about your day from maybe we got up at 6 this morning till right now, it's like 5 after 8. Just think today, how many times your mind ruined your day? Right? You're with somebody you love, you're with your dog, you're with your children, you're sitting on the couch, having your first cup of coffee, you know, first cup of coffee is like glorious, right? You finish your prayer meditation, first cup of coffee, then you get a heartbeat if you're like me, all of a sudden it's working, and everything's really like, oh my God, this is great, oh, so nice, and then the mind says, yeah, but don't forget those bills. And then all of a sudden the whole day is like, oh my God, another day of this. When am I going to hit the lottery? And why do they have a new car? And i got to go to work for this place. And suddenly the whole day changed. And then we lose our mind for a moment. We say, well, work is good. I kind of like what I'm doing. And my, my customers or my clients or my boss is a really good guy. And I am a member of AA. And God loves me. Yeah, but how about that time you were in the fifth grade? Remember that? Where was God then? <laughs> right? 
how many times during the day is the mind really screwed with you? Here's the question. How much longer are you going to let the mind take me hostage? What if today you had no thinking, no mind at all? Wow. We'd all look high if we were in here right now. <laughs> How was your day? Great. How are you <laughs> it's definitely the coffee. Yeah. <laughs> You're doing great. I was turned on to some books outside of a big book about meditation years ago. And with some reluctance, I began to read it. There was a part of me that thirsted for more information. But there was the mind saying, you better not go outside the big book. You're not an AA member. Don't do that. And the very book that got me awakened, my mind took over the book and said, don't grow any more than that. But God's going to do what God's going to do. And I picked up my first spiritual piece of information outside the book. This is years ago. And it was a book about something called, something about creative visualization. Where we remove the mind and it's like works almost with the power of intent in sitting in meditation. And it spun me around. And that just kind of ignited this thirst for more information because I found myself having deeper experiences with this power called God. And my second sponsor, Mark H. from Texas, was all over uh, books. And he kept feeding me books. Not to read. We don't want to read books. I don't want to read a book. What I want to do is experience a book. Be part of the book. Have the book become part of me. Have it internalized. And I start to see more and more and more as these books started to take its form and manifest out there how perceptions of situations cause me pain and suffering rather than the reality of it. Perceptions coming from my mind and my ego, which always blocks me from God. There's some things I do with step 10, those mechanics. I work with words like turn, watch, aware, and observe as I go through my day. Turn in in order to go out. Turn in in order to go out. It's a mantra. Turn in in order to go out. To go out there, turn in. The book says, we turn all things into the Father of light who presides over us all. Everything goes to God. Going to me, okay, God, let's go. Okay, God, let's go. Okay, God, let's go. Walking with God. Actually saying that. It resonates with a deep part. Does it resonate with the mind when I say, okay, God, let's go? It resonates with the spirit that's always there. Okay, God, let's go. Almost sounds comical, but okay, God, let's go. Because I'm going with God. I'm not going alone. And if I'm not, if I'm not supposed to be there, then God's going to say, we're not going. Okay, God, let's go. Off we go. Turn. Turn in in order to go out. If I don't turn in, I will go without. Then there's a little piece to this. If I turn in too long, you better look out. And what I mean by that is we start to pray and meditate. We turn into God, and then we start to worship the methodology. We start to worship the mechanics. I start to worship me, and ego's taking over again. It's about turning into God to experience with God, to go out there and work with you, to go out there and teach, to go out there and sponsor, to be a worker, to be a husband, to be a wife, whatever it is. Because step 12 is saying, practice these principles in all my affairs. Not the affairs that are convenient or make me look good. In all my affairs. Watch, aware, and observe. All words are interchangeable. Turn, watch, aware, and observe. Watch, aware, and observe. Mindful to where I am. How's my speech? At the beginning, this sounds like a lot of work to do, but when it comes internalized, it's part of who I be. Watch, aware, and observe. How am I doing? Should I be listening instead of speaking? Should I be speaking instead of listening? How am I doing? Where, where are my actions telling you? What are my actions like? Oh, I can say I love God and I'm a spiritual human being while I'm cheating on a friend, I'm embezzling money, whatever it is. That's not too spiritual. Or I make excuses for me that I would never make for you. That's not too spiritual. So turn, watch, aware, and observe. And our book talks about if we've harmed anyone, we make amends immediately, quickly. So during my day, I might do something unintentional perhaps, but I've hurt you. My job is to go to you and make that right now. And it might be a huge inconvenience for me, but it needs to be done. The road is narrowed. 
There's a lot of discipline in the discipline that's freedom though. Huh? There's a great piece in step 10 that will often split an AA room right down the middle. Sadly, but it's true. It says, these are the 10 step promises where we're brought to learning about getting recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Because they talked about that way back on the title page. Getting recovered. Recovered is not a bad word in Alcoholics Anonymous. It's a promise. Not recovering, but recovered. It says, we cease fighting anything or anyone, dash, almost an afterthought, even alcohol. Alcohol was a thing that was on me when I first walked in. I couldn't get away from wherever I went. Alcohol was there. It's a symptom of a greater problem. It gets removed. Now i got this life problem. And it tells me in step 10, I cease fighting people or anything else. I cease fighting my own mind. I meet resistance with no resistance. I'm not in a fight. If I fight, you win. For by this time, sanity will have returned. Back in step two, they said, came to believe that a power gain ourselves can restore us to sanity. That's the goal. Step ten, they says, here it is. The contract's delivered. Wholeness of mind, truth, God, sanity. My mind's not telling me to go drink anymore. If my mind's not telling me to go drink, I'm not drinking. I have no craving. I'm free. But now I need to grow and go out there and serve God by serving you. Huh? It says, I'll be seldom interested in liquor, and if tempted, I recoil from it as from a hot flame. You ever hit your hand on a stove? You pull it back. If I'm untreated, I'm putting the arm on. Let's see what happens now. It won't burn me too much this time. But as soon as you get her electric shock, you pull back. Oh my God, i got to be careful. And you keep moving. If that happens. If. We react sanely and normally when it comes to booze or difficulty that I'm having in my life. I'm not seeking retaliation. And I find that this has happened automatically. Watch what they tell us. We will, seldom, uh, we will see that a new attitude toward liquor has been given us without any thought or effort on my part. It just comes. This is the miracle of it. Which puts to bed, keep, keep it green, remember where you come from, think the drink through, who's keeping it green, who's remembering where we come from, who's thinking the drink through, the same mind that says, a double would be nice right now. Why not? It's been 90 days. It's been six months. One little drinky poo will be okay. Or we switch seats on a Titanic and smoke some funny cigarettes because we're not drinking. Or just a little bump here and there. I'm tired. It's okay. That's what the mind does. This is telling me just the opposite. I don't have to go into that area. Page 24, remember, talked about that my mind is going to fail me when it comes to trying to remember where I come from. God's giving me this gift of sanity. I don't have to deal with that stuff anymore. I'm here, there's liquor. Okay? And so is a chair, and so is a wall. What's next? And we can go where liquor is being served if we have good reason for being there. I have a bar mitzvah. I have a, 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 a baptism. I have a wedding. I have a, just an office party that I need to be at. I get to go to. And they're serving liquor. Okay, fine. Holidays come, people like to drink. Do I have to hide out, or can I pack into the stream of life? According to my book, I'm spiritually fit, go. This is the miracle of it. I'm not fighting it, neither am I avoiding temptation. I feel as though I've been placed in a position of neutrality, safe and protected. Then it tells me, I haven't sworn the stuff off. Remember doing that? I'm never going to do this again. Instead, the problem has been removed. It does not exist for us. I am now recovered. Experientially, can we talk about that? We ought to, if we've gone through the work. Wasn't that the goal at the beginning? I want to get recovered. I don't want this on me anymore. When we're beaten up so bad, and it was like that for me in 1988, I was living in the back of a filthy hallway, rats and cockroaches. I remember sitting on the, the, the top steps of the F train on um, near East Broadway in Lower Manhattan. Anyone knows me, if I see a spider, I move, I pack up and run away. Back then, I got to a point where I'm sitting on the steps, at the top of the, the steps of the F train in Lower Manhattan, um, Lower East Side, 
and there's got the old metal garbage pails are all piled up and rats are going all over the place and these big water bugs are running all and I'm just sitting there and I don't even care anymore. I don't care about me or my life. And everything's been flipped to a completely different direction now. 1988, I, this God, I want to know part of, it was, a, it was a long shot for me to work with, and I went from that place to having an experience with God, and I obviously no longer live like that anymore. How do we go from point A to point B? I'm the same container that was there in 1988, a little bit heavier and grayer, but it's the same container. What changed? The inside changed. The spirit was awakened, thereby giving me a whole new mind and perceptions about everything. I'd like to take care of myself. Back then I was destroying myself. I like to live in clean places. Back then I couldn't care because any hallway would do. I would drink myself to death and stick things in my arms to get to that place. And I didn't care about diseases. I just didn't care. The will to live was lost. Now I love my life. How do I go from there to here? And once I'm here, what am I doing to grow in understanding the effect of this? 1988, when I finally sobered up, I said, I want this away from me. I don't want this anymore. i got to be rid of this. It's killing me. And yet, some of us will experience that and get to, like, round step 10, clean up a few amends, and suddenly it wasn't that bad. I don't really need to pray all the time. Meditate. It's a little extreme. Nightly inventory? What kind of AA is this? When they slip that one in here, right? Make amends. All amends? I mean every amends. And we're talking a little bit too much about God because I have a drunk a lot. I have to share my story with you because my hand's up and i got to share. Okay, after you tell 10 minutes of your story and I tell 10 minutes of my story, okay, we got it. We're both drunks. Now what are we going to do about this? How are you and I not drinking? Let's talk about that. Because someone's walking the door who has 10 minutes of his story. Okay, so what? Now we're going to have a contest on who drank more and who hit a lower bottom. But no one's talking about how are we not drinking now? In fact, let's not only talk about not drinking. Let's talk about experiencing God. Permanent, guys, permanent sobriety. What you ruffle feathers in contemporary AA, I don't care. Permanent sobriety, because that's what they talked about. Our founding members talked about permanent sobriety, for good and all, is what Dr. Bob said. Well, 25 years, I don't know if it's permanent yet. I'll know when God calls me home if I'm still sober. But so far, so good. It's easy to let up on a spiritual program of action and rest on my accomplishments of yesterday, my laurels. I'm headed for trouble if I do, if I do for alcohol as a subtle foe. Okay, so I went to the University of 86th Street, so I didn't know what subtle foe meant. <laughs> Sorry. You were in my class, weren't you? <laughs> subtle. Sly, clever, devious, and difficult to detect. Subtle. Sly, clever, devious, and difficult to detect. And foe is a personal enemy. Alcohol is a subtle foe. That's what I'm looking at. It lays in the bushes, and I can't see it. You ever drive up north, and they have this thing called black ice? It looks great. And you hit the brakes, and you keep going. Can't see it. What I have is a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition. What am I doing to get my soul food? Caring for it. I'm not cured of alcoholism. I, I'm clear on that. I'll never be cured. Once an alky, always an alky. But I can get recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And the quality of my life completely changes. I will tell you guys, I've been near bankruptcy in my life. Sat with attorneys to file for bankruptcy. It was so bad. Couldn't get a job no matter what I did. I'd stand on my head. I couldn't get a job. I could not get employed. And I was willing to do anything. There was a time in my sobriety, I was walking through the streets with a rack of different types of pastries and trying to get someone to buy this so maybe I can make 50 bucks that week. Doing anything I can. A janitor, anything. How do I get through stuff like that? And there were times in this path where I even questioned God. Like, you forgot me. You left me. 
And all God was doing, like I said, sometimes it doesn't taste good, was molding and tweaking, and the time was not right. And what was I going to do when I was walking through the streets trying to get a pastry route? What was I doing when I was walking through the streets trying to get a job, and I couldn't get a job? What was I doing with me and God? Question them, argue with them, get angry with them, but continue to pray to him. And when the ground was fertile, he says, okay, go. And suddenly when I show up there, I look back at it and I can see the lessons in that. I can see all that. It wasn't a punishment. It was pruning, more pruning and more pruning because I can't get there a day shy or a day late of God's time. And God says, okay, now go. And it seems to be wherever he lands me, not where I want to go, I'm very effective in what I do. What I do for a living, I'm very effective. Nothing comes from me. All comes from my God. But I seem to be effective in what I do. Enough so where I had a couple of employees say, here are the keys. Go do what you do. I don't even want to know what you do. Just go do it. How does that happen? I rob you deaf, dumb, and blind. And employees say, here are the keys. We got the money. Just go do what you do. We trust you. My, my, my current boss said to me, I trust you. You have to tell me anything. What? Now, deep down inside, I know I'm trustworthy. The mind says, you're Peter Marinelli. They shouldn't be trusting you. <laughs> Give all credit to God. I'll take, I'll, take, I'll take the credit for the screw-ups. What I have is a daily reprieve continued on my maintenance of the spiritual condition. Here's a prayer. It says, every day is a day I must carry the vision of God's will into all my activities. Father, show me how to carry the vision of your will into all my activities, which is one of my current prayers. I ask God for the power to do that. What relationships to have and how to have them. It's none of my business. Having a life of invitation. A life of daily acceptance and surrender. It's none of my business. But we have proper use of the will. So God says, I need you to go work here and go do what you do. And then I throw everything I have at it. Everything. Where sometimes I'm left exhausted, like when I get done with these things. I'm depleted. There's nothing left. God brought me here, gives me everything, go throw it. Throw everything at it. It's proper use of the world. It's about carrying a vision of God's will to all my activities. And yet in that exhaustion, there's some settling, there's some rightness about there's some purification in that like when we work with a drunk and we hear that fifth step, we're, the, we're done for the day usually, but we can rest easy we've been purified by their stuff, and by listening and serving we feel right about everything you ever notice they hear a fifth step whoa, and they go home to do six and seven, and there's a moment where you're right truly giving ourselves to someone in service and the belly is always full. And during those difficult times with me, when I would argue and, and get angry with God, again, I would turn back to God, and somehow there was this underlying current that was saying, it's going to be okay. I don't know how, I don't know when, I can't even fathom it being okay, but I just know somehow I'm going to be okay. It's that spiritual airbag, you're going to be okay. My mind would say, well, when? Needs, mine needs an answer. Mine needs an answer right now. God would never give me the answer. Just, it's going to be okay. Just chop wood and carry water. And it's always okay. I shared a story. I don't know if it was here or someone else. I was working in Texas for a treatment center. And um, philosophies went in two different directions. And their philosophy was make more money at any cost. And my philosophy was work with a drunk. And on Labor uh, um, September is Labor Day, right? Labor Day a few years ago, uh, I got a phone call. Not even like to come in and sit down a phone call, but they were going in a different direction, have a nice life. And for about 18 months, I worked, and I'm not lying, I worked minimum 60-hour weeks. I was working 80-hour weeks, seven hours, seven days a week, nonstop. And I built a place. There was 40 beds, and I had 30 based on just my name. They were making money hands over fist. And when they decided to work with another philosophy to make more money, I was cut out by cancer. And I remember that weekend being down the Jersey Shore, crying, weeping. Who's going to hire me at my age? All I know is what I do, is being in a treatment center. I've been doing almost all my sobriety life. Where am I going to go for a job? 
and I don't have a lot of money. God, what did I do wrong? I could, I, I just, I was bewildered. I felt betrayed for a moment. But what do I do? I wept. And I got on my meditation mat and I wept as, Father, again, you're in charge. Whatever you want, but please take this from me because it's too heavy right now. It was about, a short time later, I got a phone call from a company that I had been doing some business with. And the phone call was like, listen, how about relocating? I says, I have no problem with that. Come on down. And I got a dream job. I got a job of jobs. What I do now, that's it. It brought me to South Florida. It's really interesting. I've been praying somehow, some way, I'm going to land in Florida. Working in Florida. I don't know how that was going to happen, but what God did was remove me. I did my work that he needed me to do in Texas. and says, okay, now that we did this, I need you to go here. i got to pull you away. And the pulling away says, oh my God, where am I going? Fear of the unknown. And entering the world of the spirit, we go from what we know to a place of unknown. There's some uncertainty. We're walking without banisters. How am I going to do this? And then we land and we go, everything's good. Oh my God, thank God they let me go. Couldn't see it then. Now I say, God was pruning. I have some place for you to go to. And some of us may be uprooted and moved to different parts of the country. All because God sends us there to be a beacon to others. To do some God's work. To shed some truth. That's none of my business. So I'm constantly working in prayer meditation and cleaning up what I need to do with step 10 and obviously with step 11. And I work with turn, watch, and observe throughout the day. Last thing, this sometimes again splits the room. Some folks say step 10 is about walking around. Step 11 is writing inventory at night. Uh, Some folks don't. The way I've been brought up since a newbie in AA is I look at my... Uh, step 10 work and if I have a resentment or a fear in the morning as soon as I get an opportunity after prayer and discussion if it's still there or somewhere in the middle I'm getting four column inventory out it takes me two minutes fear of you know the board meeting at one o'clock oh my god they're all gonna oh, what am I gonna do do I need to walk that's not freedom Okay, God, please remove this fear from me. Thank you for courage, strength, and direction. Sit down with James. James, I got this meeting. What do I do? I'm a little nervous about it. James, let's write some inventory. Fear. Why? What affects me? How do I set the ball rolling? Call James back. Boom. Done. Move on. Chop wood, carry water. So anyone who writes inventory, you know, as soon as you're on paper, as soon as you get to the second column, you go, are you kidding me? <laughs> this was really good up here. I got it on paper. I was like, come on. Then I quickly remember that all those people in the boardroom are just as scared as I am. Then I remember God's at the table in the boardroom too. And then I go in. And I do what God allows me to do. Speak, not speak, whatever it is. Just to be a part of. So that's how I do step 10. Besides turning to God and discussion with someone, I'll write inventory. And at night when I do my 11 step review, it's a net. Anything I missed. Anything still on my mind, anything I'm worried about tomorrow, it takes me 10 minutes, 5 minutes. If that's too long to experience the glory of God, let's remember for a moment, for you dopings being dope sick on a Sunday morning, you have no money and it's winter out walking through the streets and you're trying to figure out how you're going to get straight. Uh, For us alcoholics, when we're like this early in the morning and we have no money to get a drink, This is like kissing a baby on the cheek for all that we get in return, huh? And I'm able to on most days. But my dad told me from a little guy, and I wondered how he did it. My dad would always always tell me not to be ashamed of myself. And he would always tell me over and over, and I just look at how to do this, and I'm able to do this now. He said, keep your head up and shoulders square. You just go. You go. I think we were, my last name is Marinelli. He says, you're a Marinelli. Always be proud of that. Be proud of your heritage. Head up, shoulder square. Never be ashamed of yourself. It took me a long, long time. Years in Alcoholics Anonymous. But most days, head up, shoulder square. And walk softly and carry a big book. That's all I got.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.